Ready to explore some seriously mind-bending stuff. Always up for a challenge. Perfect, because today we're taking a deep dive into a paper that kind of kicked off a whole new way of thinking about the brain. It's called A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity, published back in 1943 by Warren S. McCulloch and Walter Pitts. Ah, uh, yes, McCulloch and Pitts. True visionaries, those two. So what makes this paper so groundbreaking? Well, for starters, they dared to connect two worlds that, at the time, seemed completely separate. The messy biological world of neurons and the clean, abstract world of logic and math. They were basically trying to explain how we think using equations back in 1943. Pretty much. And their starting point was this simple but powerful idea. The all or none principle of neurons. All or none. Yeah. So neurons either fire an electrical signal or they don't. There's no in between. It's like a light switch, either on or off, true or false. OK, I see where this is going. So they thought maybe we could describe thoughts as a series of these simple yes or no signals. Exactly. Like a chain of logic leading to complex thought. And to model this, they introduced the idea of nets, simplified versions of neural networks. Nets. So imagine a network of neurons all connected, passing these signals along like a chain reaction. Exactly. Each neuron makes a decision based on the signals it gets from other neurons. Now, initially, they focused on nets without circles, meaning there were no feedback loops. Like a one-way street in the brain. No U-turns allowed. You got it. The signal flows in one direction. But our brains don't really work in a straight line, do they? I mean, what about when thoughts loop back or memories pop up? Doesn't that get a lot more complicated? You're right. It does get more complicated when you add feedback loops. McCulloch and Pitts called these nets with circles, where the activity can reverberate and time becomes a crucial factor. That makes more sense. Our thoughts aren't just linear. They're influenced by past experiences, memories, all that stuff. Absolutely. And this circular activity, those feedback loops, are likely key to understanding things like memory, consciousness, even our sense of self. But figuring out how to model all that mathematically, well, that took things to a whole new level. So they were really pushing the limits back then. Did they have any real world examples to show how these nets might actually work? Actually, they used a pretty interesting example, that weird sensation of feeling heat after you touch something cold. Ever experienced that? Whoa, yeah, I always thought that was just me. Not just you at all. It's your neural network playing tricks on you. See, that brief cold stimulus actually triggers a specific pattern of activity in the sensory neurons in your skin. Okay. And because of how those neurons are connected, that pattern can sometimes result in a heat signal being sent to your brain, even though the actual stimulus was cold. Wait, so my brain is making stuff up. My perception isn't always accurate. It is pretty fascinating, isn't it? What we perceive is actually shaped by the structure of those neural networks. That little illusion is a perfect example of how even a simple network can create a perception that doesn't quite match reality. Okay, mind officially blown. So these nets can explain weird sensations, but what about bigger picture stuff? Did McCulloch and Pitts have anything to say about knowledge itself? You know, given that our brains seem to be playing all these tricks on us. Well, that's where their work takes a bit of a philosophical turn. Because of the structure of our brains, they argued, our knowledge of the world is inherently incomplete. And even our perception of time, that's indefinite. So we're always working with a limited view of reality, like trying to solve a puzzle with missing pieces. In a way, yes. But, and here's where things get really interesting, they saw this blind spot, not as a flaw, but as a feature. They argued that it actually allows us to create what they called useful abstractions. Useful abstractions. Okay, now you've got to explain that. Think of it as our brains simplifying the world so we can actually make sense of it. Instead of trying to process every single detail of every single thing, our brains just go tree and move on. Okay, that makes sense. We need shortcuts to survive. I mean, our ancestors probably didn't have time to analyze every leaf when a saber-toothed tiger was on their tail. Exactly. <laughs> Efficiency is key. And McCulloch and Pitts were really onto something here. They pointed out that even though these abstractions are simplified, they're incredibly powerful. They allow us to categorize things, to generalize, to understand our surroundings. So you're saying our limited knowledge is actually the foundation for all of our knowledge. That's a bit mind-blowing when you think about it. It is a bit of a paradox. It challenges how we normally think about knowledge. We tend to assume it's a perfect reflection of reality, but McCulloch and Pitts were suggesting something much more interesting. Our brains are constantly constructing reality based on the information they have, and that information is always going to be incomplete. 
So are we all living in slightly different versions of reality then? In a way, yes. And they saw this constructive process as not just essential for our survival, but for our ability to think at all. But this is where those nets with circles really come into play. Right. Those were the ones that could account for things like memory and consciousness. Those loops mean our past experiences are always shaping our present, right? Exactly. It's like our brains are constantly weaving a story of who we are, a story that's always being revised and updated with new information and experiences. Our sense of self isn't some fixed entity. It's a dynamic process. So there's no real me somewhere in my brain. It's more like an ever-changing story. Think of it like a river. It's always the same river, but the water flowing through it is constantly changing. Our sense of self is similar, a continuous flow of thoughts, feelings, and experiences that all come together to create the illusion of a stable me. Okay, now I'm really starting to see how this all fits together. But this raises another question. If our brains are essentially machines operating on logic, does that leave any room for free will? Are we really in control of our choices? Ah, free will versus determinism. It's a question that's been debated for centuries. And McCulloch and Pitt's work definitely adds another layer to the debate. Their research suggests that our choices, all those decisions we make, are heavily influenced by how our neural networks are structured, how they're activated. And those networks are shaped by our genes, our environment, all those past experiences. So are you saying that our choices might actually be predetermined? It's something to consider. But we also have to remember that brains are incredibly complex, and they're always interacting with a world that's constantly changing. There's still a lot we don't know about how all these factors work together to shape our behavior. Right. It's not like we're just robots running on a program. There has to be some level of choice, even if it's influenced by things we're not consciously aware of. Exactly. And even if our choices are influenced by things beyond our control, that doesn't change the experience of making those choices. Nope. We still feel like we're in control. And that feeling, that subjective experience, is a powerful part of what makes us human. It's definitely a lot to think about. McCulloch and Pitts really opened up a whole can of worms with their work. They did. But that's what makes their paper so brilliant. Hmm. It forces us to think deeply about what it means to think, to know, even what it means to be real. And even though it was written over 80 years ago, it's still relevant today. It's shaping how we understand the brain, how we design artificial intelligence, and how we view our place in the universe. It really is amazing. One paper sparking so many questions, so much new research. I guess it just goes to show that science is less about finding all the answers and more about asking better questions. Couldn't agree more. And McCulloch and Pitts definitely gave us some pretty incredible questions to ponder. They helped us see that the brain isn't just passively absorbing information, it's actively creating its own reality. And if we want to crack the code of intelligence, whether it's biological or artificial, we need to understand how that creation process works. Well said. And on that note, we'll wrap up part one of our deep dive. But don't go anywhere yet. We still have a lot more ground to cover. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll delve even deeper into those fascinating and slightly unsettling nets with circles and explore just how far McCulloch and Pitt's insights can take us. Welcome back. We were just starting to get into that blind spot idea. Right. How our knowledge of the world is inherently incomplete. It's kind of unsettling, but also fascinating. Absolutely. It really challenges our assumptions about how we know things. Like, do we really know anything for sure if our brains are constantly filling in the gaps, making things up as we go along? Well, that's the thing. McCulloch and Pitts didn't see this as a bad thing. They actually saw it as a necessary feature, a kind of evolutionary hack. Wait, so our limitations are actually an advantage? How does yeah. that work? Remember those useful abstractions we talked about earlier? Vaguely. Refresh my memory. <laughs> well, they argued that our brains need to simplify the world to make sense of it. Okay, that makes sense. The world is a pretty complex place. Our brains can't handle all that information all at once. Exactly. So our brains create these shortcuts, these simplified models to represent things. So instead of processing every single detail of every single thing, our brain just goes tree and moves on. Precisely. It's all about efficiency. Like our ancestors probably didn't have time to admire every leaf on a tree when a saber-toothed tiger was chasing them. Exactly. They needed to make quick decisions based on limited information. And these abstractions allowed them to do that. So you're saying that our limited knowledge is actually what makes knowledge possible. It's kind of a paradox, isn't it? But that's what McCulloch and Pitts are suggesting. It definitely challenges the way we usually think about things. 
And here's where those nets with circles become really important. Ah, yes. The ones with feedback loops. Those are the ones that could model things like memory, right? Exactly. And consciousness, too. McCulloch and Pitts believe that these feedback loops, this circular activity, were crucial for creating these abstractions. So how does that work? Well, think about how we form memories. We don't store every single detail of an experience. Instead, our brains extract the key features, the gist of what happened. You're saying that our memories are already abstractions, that we're constantly editing and reinterpreting our past. In a way, yes. Our brains are always working to make sense of things, even our own experiences. And the same process applies to our perceptions, our beliefs, even our sense of self. So it's like our brains are telling themselves a story about who we are based on these simplified models of reality. That's a great way to put it. And McCulloch and Pitts, with their logical calculus, were trying to figure out how our brains actually do this. It's amazing how much their work foreshadowed what we know today about AI and machine learning. Isn't it? They were basically describing the fundamental principles of any intelligent system, whether it's biological or artificial. So they weren't just talking about brains, they were talking about the nature of intelligence itself. Exactly. And that's why their work is still so relevant today. Okay, now I'm really starting to grasp the significance of all this. But I'm also starting to feel a little uncertain about everything. Like, if our brains are constantly constructing reality, how do we know what's real anymore? That's a great question, and one that takes us right into the heart of some really big philosophical issues. Buckle up, because things are about to get even more mind-bending. All right, so where do we even begin to unpack all this? We ended on that unsettling idea that our brains are basically constructing reality. What does that mean for how we see ourselves, our sense of self? It's a big one, right. And McCulloch and Pitts didn't shy away from these implications. Their work really challenges us to rethink what we mean by self. So are you saying there's no real me in here, that it's all just a bunch of neurons firing? Well, it's not quite that simple. Remember those nets with circles, those feedback loops we were talking about? Those are really important here. Right, the ones that explain how memories and consciousness work how our past is always influencing our present. Exactly. So it's like our brains are constantly creating a narrative, a story of me. But it's not a static story. It's always being rewritten, revised, based on new experiences. So there's no fixed self. It's more like a process, a continuous flow. Think of it like a river. It's always the same river, but the water flowing through it is always changing. Our sense of self is similar. It's a constant stream of thoughts, feelings, memories, all shaping who we are in each moment. Okay, that's a pretty cool way to think about it. But it also raises some other, even bigger questions. If our brains are essentially machines running on logic, as McCulloch and Pitts suggested, does that leave any room for free will? Are we really in control of our choices? Ah, the big one. Free will versus determinism. And McCulloch and Pitts' work definitely adds a new dimension to that debate. What they showed is that our choices are shaped by all sorts of factors, our biology, our past experiences, the environment we're in, things we might not even be aware of. So are you saying our choices are predetermined? That we're not really making them at all? Well, it's not that straightforward. We have to remember how complex brains are. We're not just simple machines following a set program. There's so much going on, so many interacting factors, that it's hard to say for sure. It's not like we're robots with no agency whatsoever. There's gotta be some space for free will in there somewhere, right? Right, exactly. And even if some of our choices are influenced by factors beyond our control, mm -hmm. that doesn't change the experience of making those choices. We still feel like we're in control, like we're making decisions. And that feeling, that subjective experience matters. It's part of what makes us human. It's a lot to wrap your head around. McCulloch and Kitts gave us a lot to think about with this paper. They did, but that's the beauty of it. This paper, written over 80 years ago, is still sparking debate and pushing the boundaries of what we know about ourselves. Right. It makes you realize how much there still is to discover about the brain, about intelligence, about consciousness. It's pretty amazing how one paper can have such a lasting impact. And not just on science. Think about the implications for philosophy, for artificial intelligence. The work of McCulloch and Pitts really helped lay the groundwork for so many of the fields we're still grappling with today. It makes you realize that science isn't about finding all the answers, it's about asking the right questions. Questions that push us to think differently, to challenge our assumptions about how the world works. Absolutely. And McCulloch and Pitts gave us some great questions to work with. They helped us see that the brain isn't just a passive observer, it's an active participant in creating its own reality. Mm. 
And that's a pretty powerful idea. Well said. And on that note, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive into the logical calculus of nervous activity. It's been a wild ride. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this exploration and maybe, just maybe, it sparked some new questions in your own mind. Until next time.